I'm not a lawyer and I'm not an analyst. I'm a senior citizen <laughs> and I'm one of the little people. Um, I was not here all day, so perhaps what I'm talking about was addressed. Excuse me if it was. Uh, it seems to me that the concentration has been entirely on how much money and through what channel the money comes in and has left out how it goes out. Now, in my experience, we have the best government money can buy. And I feel that has not changed in my life. Uh, so uh, what I'm getting at is the, uh, what was called the fairness doctrine and how the money goes out. So the candidate gets the money from whatever sources and we'd like to change that. But uh, it, still, it still goes to mostly TV, radio, uh, thank God for the internet, maybe that's going to change, but uh, since Westinghouse, General Electric, uh, Electric Disney, who knows what owns uh, the TV and the radio, uh, they have their own interests, and I feel that all of this repair of the method, change of the method of how the money comes in, will not count for much unless you do something about uh, how it is spent, uh, you know, giving them the right to public access. And so, of course, the public airwaves are owned by the public, supposedly, and I think we should guarantee uh, X hours per week, et cetera, for the campaigns. And that's what I would like to hear where people stand on that. Well, there have been efforts uh, to provide free TV time, low-cost TV time. Uh, they have been very difficult battles. In some cases, they've been tied to public financing proposals. There is some aspect of this in, in the Durbin bill. Uh, the Senate actually twice passed legislation to require that, uh, that local broadcast stations sell time at 50% below the lowest unit rate, which would have greatly reduced the cost of TV time, but it never became law. Uh, and uh, broadcasters, it's not the networks either, it's the local broadcasters that have exercised enormous power, at least in the past, with their representatives and senators, and people have not been willing to take them on. So it's, there, there's been a lot of interest in devising and providing free time on your theory, that on the general theory, the airways belong to the public, why aren't we using them in campaigns in a public way, the way many countries around the world do. But uh, that battle has not been able to be won. Uh, and um, right now, I don't think it's part of this round of fights on public financing, but it sits there as a, an important issue. Durbin, Senator Durbin has introduced legislation on this repeatedly to provide the free time on the airways. Thanks. Uh, I'm Sam Garrett from the Congressional Research Service. Thanks for the panel. Uh, I'm wondering about the Connecticut case or perhaps prospectively in the congressional case. Um, if the qualifying thresholds for public financing are relatively low and designed to encourage participation, which they seem to be um, either financially in terms of resources or administratively in terms of, of carrying out the public financing system, especially if you have um, several primary candidates attempting to get public financing, do you run into a problem of either enough financial resources to fund everyone or just administratively processing all of those applications and uh, the regulation that goes along with it? I wonder if there's anything from the Connecticut case or ideas about what that might look like in a congressional arrangement. Thanks. Too much popularity. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I will tell you that just from an administra administrative standpoint, when uh, people um, were signing up and we were passing the one-third and the one-fourth, there are a few moments where you're kind of like in your first run where you're kind of thinking, oh, God, what's happening here? Um, I mean, that definitely happened where, you know, there is that, that, that concern that sort of the, too much participation at first, it's your first uh, test. That said, um, you know, we got lucky in Connecticut that we had some special elections. Um, we had a couple in one in late 2007 and um, two in early 2008. And that gave us the chance 
really focusing just on one race at a time to try out everything that we had started building from when I got there in late 2006. Uh, that really, really showed us. And then once you get the process down, then it's sort of about timing and making sure that you can really turn it around quickly. But yes, I mean, there's no question that there are certain intense periods, particularly if you're doing what we do in Connecticut where you evaluate the grant applications in-house. Um, and uh, it is incredibly uh, demanding time-wise to look through every contribution. You have to do it. Um, we found a couple of issues doing that and denied a few grants. But it is, it is something that you have to essentially budget for high participation and, uh, and hope that works out because if we had just planned for uh, less, then, you know, we would have been in trouble. I think if the question is, is there a flood of candidates, right, and so there are, you know, 15 candidates for a state rep seat in Connecticut because there's public financing, I don't think that was seen, right? So it, Oh, I see. Maybe I, it was all I, I, I thought there was I sort of a two-part okay. question. I maybe I, I, I missed that. Yeah, no, and, and that, that we didn't, I wouldn't say that we had a flood. We definitely saw some new people enter the race, but definitely not, uh, not a flood. I, uh, what I meant, though, is the flood for us was more that of the 400 some odd candidates that were in the race, so many of them opted in. Uh, Paul Ryan, Campaign Legal Center. Bob, I have a question for you. I know you generally support the concept of public financing, but I also heard you criticize the exercise of line drawing in terms of trying to uh, quantify what constitutes a small donor or a small donation. Now, I, I know that there is a, a large goal in the construction of these or the redesign of the public financing programs is to incentivize candidates to go after small donors. Consequently, you have limits on the size of a matchable contribution, $100 in the congressional bill. I think the presidential bill will be somewhere in the neighborhood of $200. I'm wondering how you envision constructing a system of public financing if you're not going to engage in that sort of line drawing. That's part one of my question. And part two is what do you think of the $100 uh, matchable limit or $200 matchable limit? Well, I was, ultimately you have to, right, you have to write something into the law. I, I accept that. I mean, ultimately some decision has been made so that you can sort of distinguish the activities that you're going to reward a certain way or that you're going to try to, as you say, to provide an incentive for in certain ways. So I don't want to dispute the idea that ultimately in the legislative process there's some sort of line drawing. I do think um, people need to step back before their thinking on the subject becomes too rigid um, and not immediately, I suppose I should have maybe put it in these terms, not immediately allow um, a, a, a sort of a heated debate to take place over what is a small donor, just to start with, before you even get to the line drawing arguments, you know, there's already been sort of immediate efforts to sort of draw lines about, you know, was it a, was, did small donors play a meaningful part, didn't they play a meaningful part, what's a small donation exactly, and so forth, and I think that winds up very quickly getting a little bit lost. It just doesn't get you very, very far. Uh, if you ask me, what do I think about the $200 disclosure threshold? I mean, I think it's a, it's a useful threshold, obviously. The disclosure threshold doesn't necessarily uh, speak to all of the values that are associated with small donations in theory. You could pick other thresholds for that purpose, but I'm not arguing that the 200 threshold is illegitimate. I, I suppose what I'm appealing for is sort of flexibility and a realistic sense of what you're trying to accomplish. And one of the things that sort of a little, rubbed me a little bit the wrong way in the post-election period was the attempt uh, to take a very sort of strict position on what kind of small donations generally sort of qualified even for discussion purposes as small donations and to suddenly characterize certain kind of donations as small and other donations that were actually quite small as sort of repeat donations but not quite small donations which are different from large donations and I just don't think that's terribly fruitful and I think it's an example of how sort of extremes start to settle into this debate. But you're right, ultimately bills have to be written and judgments have to be made about what a, uh, what a practical line appropriately is done to be drawn. 